Hello. Welcome to those of you in the hall and to those of you at home. Thank you so much for joining us on our Made Local series to celebrate the launch of Kaufman's, the family that built Pittsburgh's famed department store by Mary Lynn Pitts and Laura Malt Schneiderman. Hello, I'm Caitlin Leisure, Development Manager at Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. And on behalf of Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures and our wonderful partner, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, welcome. Thank you to the library and to the University of Pittsburgh Press, the publisher of Kaufman's. History buffs are welcome to join us for our upcoming 10 evenings with Candace Millard and with Clint Smith. And for our next Made Local event featuring Neil Baldwin with his biography of Pittsburgh native Martha Graham. Details for these events can be found on our website. A shout out to White Whale Bookstore who is here with signed copies of Kaufman's. We love supporting a great local independent bookstore. Mary Lynn and Laura are happy to personalize your books following the lecture. You can purchase books at the table, which are pre-signed, and you can come over to the signing line, which will start here at the corner of the stage. Mary Lynn and Laura's presentation will be followed by a short Q&A with John Fagan, Marketing Director at the University of Pittsburgh Press. To quote Andrew Masich, President of the Heinz History Center, what do you get when two award-winning journalists team up to combine finely honed storytelling skills with high-tech modern research techniques? you get a first-rate history of a family and of their city. Laura Malt Schneiderman is a journalist and web developer. She has won several Golden Quills and was part of the team that won the Scripps Howard Edward J. Meeman Award in 2022. Mary Lynn Pitts has covered art, architecture, books, and history. She was a member of the news team that won the Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the Tree of Life shooting in 2018. She has won five Golden Quills an Inland Press Association Award, and a Matrix Award. Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures, and many other readers, are especially indebted to her for her coverage of books and visiting authors. Please welcome Laura Malt Schneiderman and Mary Lynn Pitts. We are very pleased to be here. Um, we have a presentation. Um, Kaufman's From Peddlers to Prosperity. Um, a lot of people ask us, how did you get this idea for this book? Can you hear me better now? Much better. Okay. I have to put my lips almost up to the microphone. <laughs> okay. um, well, I, I don't know if anybody's seen the name um, I Irene Kaufman around Pittsburgh, but if you have, I mean, I only I sort of imagined her as an older lady who had um, you know money to to donate to a good cause. Um, so it, back in um, 2000, and I'm going to say two, 2000 and um, what is it now? Nine. It's been a while. Uh, I was at a book uh, presentation by Barbara Burston, and uh, she was talking about Steel City Jews, and just kind of as a one-off, she said, oh, and Irene Kaufman um, killed herself when she was 19, and the whole room went, oh, and, and then sort of in passing, she said, and 10 years later, her mother threw herself out the window of the Ritz-Carlton in New York City, and the room again, which was packed, went, so I knew at that point that even though you see the name Kaufman's all over the place in Pittsburgh, very few people knew about Kaufman's, the family. So I kind of tucked that away. And then when Kaufman's was closing in 2015, I thought, well, maybe they'd want to do a story about that. And um, I asked, I was working at the Post-Gazette at that time as a web developer um, with a past in journalism, but at that time just a well web developer, and I asked Mary Lynn Pitts, with whom I had worked several times, if she would want to write the story. And we worked together on the story, we put out the website, and boom, our, our inboxes on our email accounts exploded in comments, the comments on the web page exploded, and then we looked at the page views, and um, we out that story outperformed the Pittsburgh Steelers that day. And when you, <laughs> <laughs> when you outperform the Steelers, you know you're on to something. Right. So we said, maybe we should go to the Pitt Press, Press. and, and the rest is history. Yeah, yeah. So, 
So, um, so the um, saga of the Kaufman family that, that built the store starts with a young man named Jacob Kaufman. And Jacob came here in 1868, three years after the Civil War. Um, and at the time that he lived in Germany, uh, German Jews did not have full citizenship and the economy in Germany was bad. And so Jacob uh, Kaufman, like a lot of young men in Europe, left Europe, came to America to seek his fortune, and when he got here, he started at the lowest possible rung. He began walking on foot all over southwestern Pennsylvania, selling um, all kinds of items like sewing uh, equipment such as needles and thread and laces and buttons and other items to people who worked in steel mills and coal mines all over western Pennsylvania. Finally, he had enough money to bring his brother Isaac over and together they peddled uh, first with a horse-drawn wagon and finally uh, two horses and a wagon. Um, and then they finally opened a store on the south side. It was about the size of a tractor trailer. They opened there in 1871. So eventually, um, all four brothers, uh, this, this is a large family. The Kaufman family is quite large. They had a monopoly on cattle and horse stealing in their little corner of Germany. Um, but uh, the brothers who came over after Jacob there were four of them, um, Isaac, Morris, and Henry. And um, they joined the business, and initially they opened up stores on not just the south side, but another on the north side, and then the famous one downtown. Um, and this picture, this is from 1890, and I'll, I'll try to work the little <laughs> laser pointer there. Mm. Ah, okay, so that's Jacob and his wife, Augusta. And then the next is... Henry and his wife, um, Teresa, right. and then the next one is um, Morris mm -hmm. and his wife, Betty, and this is Isaac and his first wife, Emma, who is the namesake for Emma Kaufman Camp. And if you could just, just put your pointer back on Morris for a moment, the man with the mustache there, that is the man who was the father of Edgar Kaufman, the man who commissioned uh, Frank Lloyd Wright to build falling water. So, um, so the Kaufman business began to uh, develop um, on Smithfield Street. And if you look at the very top here, at the left end of the building, you can see that there's a uh, goddess of Lady Liberty up here on the top. Uh, the Kaufmans wanted to demonstrate their patriotism, and this light, uh, this statue was actually lit by a gas lamp. An employee had to climb up and light it every, every uh, night, and it could be seen from all over the city. Um, Kaufman's was initially um, uh, called Kaufman's Cheapest Corner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it, um, you know, it uh, aspired to you know, a higher level of retail. Uh, so it also had daily advertisements in the newspaper touting its fair dealing, its low prices, and its quality goods. And in 1885, they hired their first woman sales clerk, and they found her quite conveniently. The Kaufman brothers used to eat breakfast at a restaurant across the street from the store, and they noted that the young woman who was in charge there was quite astute with uh, numbers and business, and her name was Emma Farr, so they lured her away from the restaurant to work for them. So, um, you know, the, the business grew under these four brothers in, in the manner that we've been talking about, but as the brothers aged, they began to think, who's going to take over? Right. Who's gonna take over this business and be the next generation? Um, of the four brothers, the oldest was Jacob. And the four brothers had, I, I should say, a deal. They had a contract that if one of them died, the other brothers had to buy out that, that brother's portion from his survivors. Right. Okay, so Jacob, the oldest, was the first to die. The other brothers bought out his portion but uh, his widow and his five sons were not 
pleased. They were not happy. They thought they were being shorted. So they left in quite a huff and took half the staff of the store with them, and they went two blocks down the street and formed Kaufman and Bear, which became Gimbel's later. Yeah. So they were competing with Kaufman's head-to-head, two blocks away. (laughs) So they were out for the second generation. Right. Um, The next brother, Isaac, had a daughter, one child, a daughter, Lillian. The next brother had four children, two sons, two daughters. And the last brother, Henry, uh, had just one one child, Irene, who we already said had had, um, swallowed poison and killed herself at a very young age. So uh, one of Morris's sons, now daughters were not really considered in line to take over businesses at this time. Um, One of Morris's sons, the older, Edgar, he was a real devil. He was handsome, a lady killer. He was groomed to take over the business. Um, He went to uh, Shadyside Academy. He went to a year to Yale. He had apprenticeships at department stores in Europe. And uh, he also worked at a store in Connellsville. And then he worked in like every department in Kaufman's. And he was the one they wanted to take over. And eventually he did take over. Um, but we do have a picture here of Irene Kaufman, um, and you, as you can see from this portrait, she was sort of the quintessential Gilded Age girl. Uh, the, uh, this, is, this hangs in the Jewish Community Center up in Squirrel Hill. Uh, the Gibson girl hairdo, the beautiful uh, pale uh, purple gown. She appears quite docile here, um, but we also found another view of Irene Oops. Kaufman. Um, Here she is astride her own horse. She was very high-spirited, very headstrong, popular, had lots of friends. She loved to drive cars, and she loved to shop. Um, And... um, Uh, 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 Go ahead. No, Uh, it's okay. This is the the dedication to her. After her death, her parents uh, paid for the organ in Rodolf Shalom Congregation, the synagogue on Fifth Avenue he, that you may have noted in, in Shadyside. Um, she, uh, they, they, they dedicated it to her. Um, they also dedicated um, other things, the, the Irene Coffin Settlement in the Hill District, and uh, also uh, the main building of the JCC is in her name. Um, The story apparently is that the family would not allow her to marry the man she loved, who was the family chauffeur. (laughs) Um, I just do want to interject something here, and that is is that generations of people who grew up in Pittsburgh know of the Irene Kaufman settlement because uh, generations of immigrants went there to learn all manner of things. They studied for their citizenship test, They learned to assimilate into American life. Um, And in fact, uh, one of Andy Warhol's teachers, Samuel Rosenberg, a a great artist in his own right, uh, taught art classes at the Irene Kaufman Settlement. And you did not have to be Jewish of, uh, of, of the Jewish faith to go there either. You did not. So it's, it's sort of a, an important period in Pittsburgh history that um, that that settlement house existed. There were settlement houses in New York and in Chicago, but Pittsburgh also had one. So we should mention here that this is a family of first cousins. I know that doesn't sound correct (laughs) at this time and place, but in Europe especially, where there were small Jewish pockets of Jewish populations, it was not uncommon to marry your first cousin, perhaps, or even uncles and nieces. In this family, uh, we mentioned Isaac, his first wife, who died young, was his first cousin, and their child was Lillian, and, or Lillian, as she liked to call herself, and um, in a fortuitous development, Lillian and Edgar, her first cousin, the son of Morris, got married. Now, Pennsylvania did not permit marriage between first cousins, so they had to take a special train out to New York in order to have the wedding. 
And now, this is a wonderful photograph here of Lillian Kaufman when she's young. Um, um, and one of the things that we discovered as we worked on our book was what an incredibly accomplished woman she truly was. Um, she was raised to be a philanthropist uh, by her father, uh, who early on gave a building over in Polish Hill to the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. You can still see the Kaufman name on the building. Um, but Lillian, um, during the 1930s, uh, when America was experiencing the Great Depression, decided to employ seamstresses to sew her own clothing designs. And eventually this led her to found the Vendôme, which became um, a destination boutique here in Pittsburgh. You took a special elevator to go up. You could have your portrait taken there. You could buy Stuben glass. You could buy Swarovski crystal. And you could buy the best designer fashions from all over. Um, and she founded it, and she called it the Vendôme because she stayed at the Place Vendôme in Paris when she went on her buying trips. Um, she also was the leader of the board of Montefiore Hospital for 10 years. She's the only woman who ever did that. And in fact, she was the only woman who ever led the board of Montefiore Hospital. Um, she also was an art patron. She loved art. She uh, bought it. Um, she was a patron of Diego Rivera, the famous mural muralist, and also Frida Kahlo. Both of them visited Falling Water during their lifetimes. Um, and she also was a dedicated volunteer at Mercy Hospital and also at Montefiore Hospital. Her letters are full of her experiences at both of those hospitals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Try Any again. better now? Okay. Her, her husband, Edgar, her cousin, I mentioned he was very handsome. Um, he was the anointed heir of the family business. He was a big risk taker, which worked out very well for him professionally, not so well personally. He liked people a lot. He loved to talk to people. And he made, his goal was to make retailing a white collar profession. He actually started his own um, major at uh, CMU and later Pitt. Uh, it was a bachelor's degree you could get to, to in retailing. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it was called the Research Bureau for Retail Training. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he would recruit people from schools all over uh, the region and even Ivy League schools. And, of course, employees of the store were also encouraged to take this training. It was very good for, for women who ended up becoming buyers and other holding uh, responsible, responsible positions in the store. And here's one of the first, Edgar Kaufman was always happiest when he was building. Um, and this is the house that he built with his wife Lillian in the 1920s. Um, it's called La Tourelle, or some people call it La Tourelle. Um, Tourelle meaning tower from the French. You can see the little Normandy, Norman style tower here in the picture. Um, and this house was built in the 20s and uh, the architect was Benno Jansen, who was um, a, a very desirable architect for high society Pittsburgh. He um, designed Longview Club. He designed um, an addition to the Duquesne Club and um, many other beautiful buildings here in Pittsburgh, including the Pittsburgh Athletic Association. So um, Edgar was um, also a civic leader. He was part of the transformation of downtown Pittsburgh um, back when the point looked like an industrial wasteland full of uh, rail cars and slums and bridges. Um, he was part of the group that got together and said, we need to clean up Pittsburgh's front door. And that's when Renaissance One took off and they transformed uh, Point State Park into the beautiful park that we know it as today. Um, and of course, later um, in the 50s, it was Edgar's idea to build the Civic Arena. Um, 
and uh, as a home for the Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera. Here is a rare photo of the Civic Arena with its retractable roof fully retracted. I don't know how many people here remember the Civic Arena. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, it, it was a unique architectural achievement when it was built. It did not work in practice as well as was hoped, but Edgar had that vision for it to be, like he said, a mother hen putting her wings around her chicks. That's how he envisioned it. Um, he, he was very involved in many civic uh, endeavors. One was the Civic Light Orchestra, which he uh, personally funded in its early seasons. He gave a million dollars toward construction of the Civic Arena when a million dollars really meant something. <laughs> um, during the Great Depression, he came up with this idea called the Pittsburgh Plan. And the idea was that local re retailers, department stores, mm -hmm. uh, would, would contribute a percentage, like 1% of their revenues, uh, toward a, a fund which would pay out-of-work people to work on civic projects like roads. And he always felt that having people work for wages was more dignified than just giving them charity. Unfortunately, uh, th this didn't work for the nation because th the problem was so widespread and so deep that it needed a, a federal, a, a national solution. But that was his idea locally. He also worked as a dollar a year man, just making literally a dollar a year to work for the federal government during World War II. Uh, he, he was in charge of price controls and markets during the war. Now the, um, one of the uh, high points of the Kaufman marriage here was Edgar Kaufman Jr., uh, their only son. Um, and Edgar, um, initially in his life wanted to be a painter and he went to Europe and he spent time studying painting. Um, eventually he came home um, as uh, you know Hitler came to power in uh, Germany. Edgar came home and he um, worked for a while at Kaufmann's and he later went to the Museum of Modern Art. He became a curator there and he um, was best known for his work in staging exhibitions of good design. Um, he also was a fellow at Taliesin in Spring Green, Wisconsin. That's where he went to study with Frank Lloyd Wright. And um, although he was there for less than a year, it was enough time for his parents to come to Taliesin and to meet Frank Lloyd Wright and to decide to hire him to build their house, uh, their, their mountain home, as they called it, in Fayette County. Um, so Edgar was um, a key player in that saga. And then he also became the steward of Falling Water after his parents died and deeded it to the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, which is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I don't know if you know this or not, but the two things that most people want to see when they come to Western Pennsylvania are Falling Water and the Andy Warhol Museum. So. Um, those are the two usually on most people's hit parade. <laughs> so another high point, a good, a good outcome of this marriage uh, of cousins was uh, this massive renovation of Kaufman's in 1930, not long after the market crashed. The market crashed, it didn't really affect a family like the Kaufman's. They were so wealthy it it didn't, it didn't really singe them. So they, they built this renovation, no expenses spared. They were bringing in, um, they wanted it very modern, very art deco. They were bringing in black Carrera glass from, from uh, Italy. They had art deco wrought iron, or wrought metal decorations on, on the elevator doors and everywhere else. They had this, um, blonde wood cabinets that you can see set in like a diagonal pattern instead of just merely a, merely um, perpendicular uh, uh, hallways. And they commissioned these murals, these enormous murals from Boardman Robinson, uh, which were supposed to 
show the history of commerce. Uh, you can't really see it here, but the style was very similar to the Depression era um, murals that you see in post offices, kind of like Thomas Hart Benton. And mm -hmm. they were not what you would call sensitive uh, by today's standards. Uh, but at the time, they added a lot of color and history to the look of the store. So it was very sleek and elegant, which is really what the Kaufmans liked. Another high point of their marriage was the construction of Falling Water, the summer home that they built in Fayette County, and they were building it in the mid-1930s during the Great Depression. It was built over Bear Run Creek, and um, it's often been described as sort of a cubist sculpture in the woods, and it appears to be balanced over a waterfall. It opened in 1937, and it made the cover of Time magazine and major architectural magazines, but Mrs. Kaufman called it leaking water <laughs> because, like many great Frank Lloyd Wright buildings, it had problems with its roof. Uh, but nonetheless, the Kaufmans went there because they wanted to get away from the dirt and the smog of Pittsburgh in the 1930s. This is at a time when pilots who flew over Pittsburgh described it as looking like a great big black ball of ink. Um, and so falling water for the Kaufmans was a cool green refuge from the dirt and the congestion of Pittsburgh. And then later on, it became a salon of sorts for their friends uh, who, who came to visit. And that would include people like Albert Einstein, who they hosted at their home, uh, La Torrell, uh, at first, and then also um, Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, and uh, many musicians and artists, and also one of Edgar Kaufman's very close friends, H.J. Hines II. We mentioned the, cr the creation of the Von Dome Boutique, and Mary Lynn was talking about how it was at the top floor of Kaufman's. You had to take that special elevator to go all the way to the top floor um, to get to the Von Dome. Um, it, employ it, it employed seamstresses who made uh, her designs, that made her jewelry. Um, it, it sold crystal and Stuben glass and art. And she became uh, a successful businesswoman, which she never thought she would be. She was as astonished as anybody else. Right. And she was not one to accept limitations on her budget. Her secretary described how she would uh, take the budget and she'd just rip it up. <laughs> that, was, that was your budget. <laughs> So um, the woman pictured here, uh, her name is Billy Scheibel, and she was known in Pittsburgh as public hostess number one. She, <laughs> she was the madam of a local brothel. Um, and the reason we have her pictured here is that Edgar was a, uh, a frequenter of Ms. Scheibel's uh, home, uh, or house, uh, as they call it. Uh, she was um, uh, well-known here in Pittsburgh, often photographed in newspapers when she was arrested. Um, Edgar, ch Edgar cheated many times. He was uh, what we'd call today a serial philanderer. Uh, he had mistresses and who, uh, who he kept and uh, uh, women uh, who he paid. We mentioned, or we may have mentioned, that Edgar was really interested in technology, and both the Kaufmans in this marriage liked to be on the cutting edge, to be avant-garde. Um, Edgar loved technology. Um, in 1909, uh, that was the year they got married, they put a full-size reproduction of a Curtis biplane, that's the first commercial airplane, inside of Kaufmans along with models of six other airplanes. The next year, Edgar had an exact replica of the Wright Brothers airplane hanging from the ceiling with its, um, in the first floor, with its motor running and its propellers turning. Uh, in 1912, he displayed the world's fastest car at that time. Uh, you can see it there. It, is called, it was called the Mercedes Blitzen-Benz II. 
and in the 1940s, the store displayed a blitz buggy, what we call a Jeep, which was made in Butler, PA. Um, and in the 50s, in 1957, uh, they displayed on the store's roof an all-steel home, a steel air home. This is what you can do with steel. You can have everything in steel, your kitchen cabinets, your kitchen um, appliances, your bedroom, everything. Uh, this model with seven rooms, four bedrooms, it was called the Steel Air Fifth Avenue, and uh, they loved to be on top of things. Even in the 1920s, Edgar was wiring the store for television. Now, when we go into a store today, we take for granted the fact that um, we can look at a price tag and know what the merchant is asking for, uh, for whatever it is they're selling. But in the early days of the department stores, um, as around like the 1870s or so, if you went in and looked at a shawl, uh, you would ask the sales clerk, um, well, how much? Because there were no price tags. And so the sales clerk would size you up and sort of guess by how well or how poorly you were dressed what you could afford to pay. And then you would sort of agree upon a price. Well, Kaufman's uh, followed the lead of a uh, well-known um, uh, department store tycoon, John Wanamaker, in Philadelphia, and decided that they were going to have price tags. And they advertised the fact, and you can see in this ad here, that it was one price for all. In other words, they were going to make sure that everything was priced and everyone would pay the same. Um, the other thing they were well known for was um, sort of the breathless tone of their florid advertising. They would, um, um, it was just really sort of over the top. You get a little flavor of it here. In 1926, they did something kind of innovative. They hosted what amounted to a World's Fair inside the store, and they called it um, the 1926 Exposition. And what they wanted to show was how much went into all the things you buy in an apartment store, how they got that good quality, where it came from, what kind of craftspeople worked on your material or what have you. So they had demonstrations of all kinds of crafts, how they were being made, they also had Beethoven's piano. I don't know why. <laughs> um, Lalique glass. They had Filipino women making embroidery in a, quote, native hut. Um, rug weaving. They had electronic transmission of photographs, which sounded to us like early fax machines almost. Um, and they had a replica of the Fort Pitt blockhouse made entirely of candy and weighing more than 200 pounds. <laughs> And this, th I'm gonna, we're going to give you just a little flavor of how they advertised this exposition. They talked about, and this is just one phrase in, in a very long section, brasses from fabled Baghdad and embroidered banners celebrating the might of Manchu emperors. <laughs> uh, total hoopla. <laughs> well, the end of the family... Um, Really, the, the end of the family's connection to the store really came in the 1940s and the 1950s. Uh, the people pictured here, there's Lillian Kaufman on the left, and to her, uh, next to her is I.D. Wolf. I.D. Wolf was um, Edgar Kaufman's brother-in-law, and he um, was also often the man in charge of the store when Edgar was away. Um, Edgar did not want to have to choose between um, giving leadership of the store to his brother-in-law, I.D. Wolf, or his brother, Oliver, who also worked in the store. It was just a very difficult family dilemma. So Edgar decided in 1946 that he would sell Kaufman's to the May Company, a chain of department stores, and uh, even though he retained the, the title of president. And um, he essentially began spending much of his time out in Palm Springs, California, where he, he built yet another house. And kept his mistress. And kept his mistress. Yes. <laughs> um, I'd 
don't know if any of you remember ever seeing the Galleria look like this. Okay. When Kaufman's, after the Kaufman family died out and m the May Company out of St. Louis was in charge, um, they began moving out to the suburbs, um, but they were slow to do so. And what they did was, in their minds, the department store was really its own mall. We have everything under one roof. We are the mall. So when they built a store uh, out in Mount Lebanon, it was a freestanding store. It looked like this. Right. And the same in the North Hills on McKnight Road. And, and the same in Monroeville. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they did not see a need to join any kind of shopping mall at first. Actually, um, they were very um, late to, to moving to malls because initially they had freestanding stores of their own. Um, in 1986, they took over three Gimbel's locations in, in malls here in western Pennsylvania. And they were actually surprised at the level of increase in sales um, that they experienced. So they moved, of course, to South Hills Village Mall and also to the Beaver Valley Mall, the Monroeville Mall, and the Ross Park Mall. And then, of course, um, they had a major expansion uh, over the ensuing decades to all kinds of places in the region. Um, in Pittsburgh, you know, I mean, in Pennsylvania, of course, they were in Pennsylvania, and in Erie, and they were outside of Greensburg and Beaver Valley, as we mentioned. In Ohio, they were in Steubenville and St. Clairsville, Youngstown, Cleveland, and Allentown. And in New York, they had a store in Rochester. In West Virginia, a store in Charleston. Um, and a lot of these stores had been local department stores with another family's name on them. But May, the May Department Store Company decided to rebrand them as Kaufman's, which was not always very popular with those cities. In 1993, they hit a high point of sales. They had $1.2 billion in sales. And then, of course, you're looking here at a picture of um, an entrance to um, a mall. I believe this is Century 3 uh, Mall, which was, was, was built atop a slag heap. And this was the entrance that you went into if you went to the Century 3 Mall Kaufman's. Um, in t the, the sort of beginning of the decline was in 2002 when May merged Kaufman's with its Filene's division, which was based in Boston. And then all of the executive operations were moved to Boston. And the result of that was 1,200 office jobs in downtown Pittsburgh were just eliminated. And that represented about 1% of downtown Pittsburgh's workforce. So um, throughout the 2000s, service and uh, displays and quality, you know, it was a, a downhill slide, unfortunately. Then came along someone who decided that they wanted to revive downtown retail. Now, maybe a lot of you, your, your parents took you downtown for the good shopping when you were a kid. And many people could not imagine downtown without a heavy retail presence. And, and that was how Mayor Tom Murphy of Pittsburgh felt about it in the 90s. So he put his weight behind reviving downtown retail. Um, so the city used tax money to bring in a Lord and Taylor and to build a more centrally located store for Lazarus, which had taken over uh, Kaufman's rival Horn's department store. Um, and of course, they had um, a Saks downtown. So to make room for the uh, Lord and Taylor, to give Lord and Taylor a presence, they decided to take the Mellon Bank first building and um, jackhammer its interior uh, and redo it. Um, unfortunately, this, this interior included all kinds of irreplaceable marble and um, I don't even know what kind of metal, beautiful, beautiful furnishings, 
and much of it was just put in the sub-basement into storage. Others were just destroyed outright, and in moved Lord and Taylor. Uh, they, the mayor failed to get Nordstrom to commit to coming downtown. We all know Nordstrom is in the North Hills. That's because the Nordstrom family was friends with the Rooney family. The Roonies were based on the north side. So Nordstrom went on the north side. Um, within five years, all these new stores closed. Lauren Taylor and Lazarus, no more. And um, that meant that there was no no horns presence downtown. Gimbel's was no more. Kaufman's was the last downtown department store in Pittsburgh. Well, if you look closely at this picture, you can see here that um, on the um, marquee is the name Macy's, but right above it, carved into the building, is the name Kaufman's. And um, it was the last department store standing and, and operating in downtown Pittsburgh. It was rebranded as a Macy's in 2006. It closed in September of 2015. And the last time any of us saw Christmas windows in Kaufman's was December of 2015. Um, some of the uh, Kaufman's employees decided to get together and put a Santa uh, clause in the lobby of one Oxford Center so that children could still come downtown and see Santa. And uh, they had a, an exhibit set up next to the Santa, and they had Macy's at the top of its naughty list. <laughs> so we thought we would um, include some photos of some traditions that people really loved about, about Kaufman's. Um, one is the Christmas windows. Here is a, a young uh, spectator with his, it looks like an Instamatic camera, taking a picture of one of the uh, Christmas windows at Kaufman's. Oops. And here is um, one of the designers setting up a window in 2013 for a theme, the magic of Christmas was the theme that year. And do you want to talk about I this one? I think this is the um, traditions of Christmas, actually. Um, I want to say th something about the window uh, designers. They were incredibly creative. Um, the window designers were just unbelievable. They, they would go scrounging in dumpsters. They would, um, they would um, also rely on a company up in New York called Spath Design to come up with some of the figures that we saw in some of the Christmas windows. Um, they uh, often worked in the uh, windows when uh, the winter, of course, had come, and there was no heat in those windows, so they were very cold. Um, and uh, then, of course, when they did the windows in the summer, there was no air conditioning. So th they weren't working exa in exactly optimum conditions. Uh, the uh, Another big tradition that everyone loved was, um, well, Kaufman's, like many department stores, had an outdoor clock. This was the second inter iteration of their clock. Their original clock was eh, kind of plain, just square, nothing really to speak of. The, this clock, of course, is much more fancy with, um, I, I don't even remember if this is Atlas or other strong men holding up the clock. In this case, there is an actual person <laughs> cleaning the clock, and he <laughs> looks like one of the figures. <laughs> and uh, the, the saying was, meet me under Kaufman's clock, right? Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And here we have um, two really great images of, of the clock. Um, here on the left um, is a more modern image, and then on the right, this picture is from 1971, and you can see that people have actually climbed up on top of the clock. They're celebrating the fact that the Pittsburgh Pirates have won the World Series. <laughs> which, we, which we will not see in our lifetimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, today, Kaufman's, ironically, is still the last, about the last spot where there is retail downtown. There is a Target in, in one part of the first floor of the former Kaufman's building. Of course, um, the rest of the building is apartments and um, uh, a, hotel. a hotel, that's right. right, and even hotel and a um, coffee shop. 
uh, coffee and pastry shop. Um, and all that is left of Kaufman's is part something from the 1930 redesign. There, there are plates of wrought, wrought iron uh, in a, a Art Deco pattern that line both sides of the entrances when you walk in on the first floor. If you don't know what they are, you'll have no idea why they're there or what they are. <laughs> but that is what they represent, the last little scrap of Kaufman's that is there. And the other half of, of the first floor is um, going to be Burlington. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. They'll be moving in there, and right now it's under massive renovation, so it's just gutted. Oh. So yeah. that, is, that is the story of Kaufman's history. by really quickly that was really fun to hear good thank there's you there's so many details of the book that you can't cover of course because but I'm going to throw you a question that I didn't go over with you what was where was your main source of what did you use for research what were your main sources there must have been many but it just struck me as I listened to you what were some of the highlights of where you did the research to create the book we went through about every page of newspapers that were available to us and even even when those books were in not quite the galley form, but almost ready to go into galleys, you know, Mary Lynn is saying, oh, I just found this story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, they wouldn't publish it in Pittsburgh. I found it in the, yeah. the New Jersey papers right. um, yeah. about, well, we won't say, but, um, uh, you know, we were, we were still finding little tidbits of information. We got a, a lot of information from um, the Western PA Conservancy because they had the letters of uh. the Kaufmans there, and of course the History Center. Right, we spent a lot of time at the History Center. Mm -hmm. The Kaufman, the Kaufman store archives are at the Heinz History Center on the sixth floor. There's a wonderful library there, and we got to spend a lot of time there looking at pictures of, um, of you know, Kaufman's displays and uh, seeing, um, you know, sort of store records and, um, I, I interviewed somebody who worked at Kaufman's as a security clerk, or as, as a security person, and in the early days, um, we, we never found this, but apparently in the early days, Kaufman's kept a very careful record of the names of shoplifters and, their, and what they stole and what the amount was, and you know they were usually sent up to um, a, uh, a workhouse in Blonox. So um, they, were, they were very careful record keepers, the Kaufman's, yeah. The other thing you touched on at the beginning I thought was interesting, there's such a classic story of American success, you know, coming from Germany yeah. and, grow and, and, and succeeding so remarkably. But they as a family, not just Edgar and Lillianne, the, the whole family really believed in giving back to Pittsburgh in so many ways. And I think that's something that people forget since the yeah. time's gone by right. since then. Yeah. They, and, uh, they gave a lot philanthropically. In addition to that, they gave a lot to their employees. Um, they, you know, in terms of employee benefits, which were not really done at that time, they had their own room for the employees. They had a restroom. They had a room where you could rest. And they had a, a cafeteria, which was free of charge. They even did things like pay for their employees' um, c children's college tuition. And they had a lawyer uh, like who came to the store, I think, every week or every other week. Mm -hmm. And you could meet with this person, with this man, for, uh, for free for a certain length of time. You know, one th I'd just like to follow up on that. Um, one thing that um, Edgar Kaufman did, that he, because he bankrolled the Pittsburgh Civic Light Opera for many of its early seasons, um, that got the uh, organization off the ground. And that... Um, organization is still performing today, now at the Benetton, and one of the things that they do is that they honor the best in high school musical uh, theater performance every year. Uh, it's called the Gene Kelly Awards Program. Um, and so um, that that's a performing arts organization that has really um, established a level of excellence here in Pittsburgh. And so young people who are interested in a career in the performing arts have a chance to be part of that early on in their lives. So um, it's no wonder that there are a lot of people from Western Pennsylvania who were on Broadway. 
And you mentioned the whole idea of training their employees to be professional retailers as mm -hmm. opposed to kind of bringing it up to a professional level as opposed right. to that. That's really interesting. Yeah. They, they also had like their own um, science lab where they would test the fabrics and then they would give it like their own good housekeeping seal of approval and advertise that on the racks and say like, you know, how, how well made the fabric was, what, you know, what scientifically went into the fabric. So it was something behind what they sold, in other words. Right, they put their to just right. let you know yeah. there was a lot of quality there. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. You know, despite their success on that theme, again, they, they did face certain setbacks in a lot of different ways socially that people may not be aware of. Is that something you're interested in talking about at all? Uh, well, they were kept out because they were Jewish, although they were not at all observant. I mean, I don't think that they ever attended services. And if you look at the Falling Water Cookbook, you will note plenty of um, <laughs> pork dishes and <laughs> other things that Jewish people don't traditionally <laughs> eat. But um, because they were Jewish, they were, of course, barred from various uh, clubs and other places where the power brokers of the city met. One of these places was Rolling Rock, where they have, um, where they had, or races, have, yeah. um, horse racing, which the Kaufmans were very much into. They had their own horses. They raised their own horses and rode them. Um, and one time when they had guests coming over from France, since they were not allowed on the grounds of uh, Rolling Rock, they decided they would bring a tailgate lunch of um, Cornish game hens and other very tasty items, which was uh, naturally what we all bring to a tailgate. <laughs> um, so that was part of, part of their being uh, kept out of things. Well, uh, and as a family, they're complex, like all families are complex, so I thought you touched on some of those things, but I think it's interesting as far as, you know, personally and their business dealings with each other. Um, I think that's an interesting thing to people here in Pittsburgh about how a family, like all families, has its issues, right? So right, absolutely. They had yeah. that feud with, with the older brother's family. Yeah. They never made it up. No, they never did. They no, never they made they it up. Yeah, the family split after, you know, there was a very decisive split between Jacob Kaufman's branch of the family and the rest of the family after 1905 because that lawsuit went all the way to the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, so it was hard fought. Are there still Kaufmans in the area? Yes, there's um, the widow of John Wolfe um, still lives, I believe, in Western Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. But there's no direct descendants. No direct descendants. Leon because right, right. their son never had any children. Right. right, right. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, can you talk about their impact on social justice here in Western Pennsylvania in the sense of you touched on that to women, mm -hmm. um, helping the poor, mm -hmm. uh, helping immigrants, and all that, and all those important aspects of what they did for the community. They felt very strongly about helping the poor, and in fact, that was one area where they and the Kaufman and Bear people could get along because they did um, do some charitable work with them. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, when the strike was going on at uh, Homestead, PA. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, gave they gave things to all the little children in the area, but to those families who were hit by the strike, they also gave clothing um, in addition to candy. Um, mm -hmm. Also, Edgar was very involved in raising money constantly for the Jewish community, and he really wanted to improve Pittsburgh's reputation. One of the things he did to do that is he hired um, a writer by the name of Stefan Laurent to write this book about Pittsburgh, and practically every Pittsburgher owns a copy of this book. <laughs> um, you can still buy it pretty much at a used bookstore, I think. Um, but that book was basically commissioned by Edgar Kaufman as so as to promote uh, Pittsburgh and its rebirth. It was essentially an effort to uh, dispel Pittsburgh's image as a smoky city or as hell with the lid off. Um, so, um, yeah, I think Edgar was always um, in the forefront of developing the city's, uh, putting the best uh, face on the city of Pittsburgh and, and inviting people here.
running out. Of, we're running out of time. Um, okay. Thank you very much for yeah. answering our questions. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so uh, now Mary Lynn and Laura will sign copies of your books if you want. I'm free to purchase them too. So.